I had it locked. Right, go ahead and turn me down just a little bit, or at least on the monitors up here. Today has been a weird Sunday, hasn't it? How many of you like time change? No hands, huh? And no hands. I don't mind the other one. I don't mind the one in October because I get up on a Sunday morning. It's like, oh, I've got to get ready in an hour, you know. I enjoy that, but this time change, I cannot stand it. Take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs 25. <clears throat> I think they just need to decide what time it is and leave it at that. We're in Proverbs chapter 25. And uh, before we get started, I want to tell you about when I was a kid. I was probably five, six, seven years old, and I was into Legos big time. I like building, you know, uh, I like the guys having guns running around, and they'd face the enemy. And so my dad was playing with me one time, and I built a realm. What's a realm? I don't know. It was a bunch of cool stuff. Man, I had my Lego guys strategically placed. If someone came in that side, they were going to be able to defend against them. If they came in this side, they were going to be able to defend against them. They'd have to go through this jungle with all sorts of traps and other things going on. I was enthralled with Legos. I absolutely loved it. My dad, <clears throat> he spent all of his time while I was spreading out my realm and my kingdom. He was building a super weapon. And he's over there on his side of the living room, and I'm on mine. He's building his super weapon. He's building all his stuff together. And then it was time to attack. I wasn't ready. I wasn't planning on it. I didn't even know we were attacking each other. I thought we were on teams, but it was time to attack. And all he did was fire one giant daddy fist over and destroyed everything. And I was like, oh, no, what did you do? He said, well, you didn't have any walls built. You know, I didn't have any walls to defend my realm. And that's a little bit about what we're talking about today, walls, building walls. Look at Proverbs 25, 28 with me. It says, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Dear Father, thank you for all you've given to us, Lord. Dear Lord, I ask that you fill me with Holy Ghost, Lord. Give me the words you want me to say, and I pray that you meet with each and every one of us in here. I pray that we get something from this lesson, and um, that we can apply in our lives, even this week, something that will change our lives. Thank you for all you've given to us, Lord, and bless this service. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. <clears throat> you look at walls, and the purpose of walls is to defend, isn't it? It's to protect. But you look at this verse here, and it says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit. And we can look at today, we look at kids in the supermarket, right? And we're walking down the aisle, and they're screaming and throwing a tantrum. And you're thinking, if you were my kid, oh, we'd be out in the vehicle right now, right? And, uh, but they have no control, no rule over their own spirit. You know, and I got to thinking about this when it comes to the topic of attitudes, Attitudes. Now, what is an attitude? The definition of it is a predisposition or a tendency to respond positively or negatively towards a certain idea, object, person, or situation. It's how we, it's how we react. Attitude it influences an individual's choice of action and responses to challenges, incentives, and rewards together called stimuli or stimulus, you know, outside stimuli affecting it. But attitude, too many people let feelings control their attitude. And there's a problem with that. Now, feelings and attitude, they're not the same thing. Feelings are emotions such as sadness, anger, happiness, and attitudes are general approach to a situation or life in gen general. They're very close, but they're not sa the same thing. But too many people, Christians included, let their attitude be dictated by how they feel. And if you've heard me preach at all, you've probably heard me talk about this. I'm very big on principles versus feelings. Feelings, what's the problem with feelings? 
they change. Feelings are fickle. They can change. I can remember, I can remember in high school growing up, and uh, there was a girl I liked on this day, and a girl I liked on this day, but there were girls that I liked, and as I'm walking down the hallway, whether they looked at me, smiled at me, spoke to me, gave me a funny look, that could dictate my feeling. Feelings are, are fickle. They can easily change. You look at the weather, especially here in Michigan. It tells you, oh, it's going to be sunny outside. And man, you start to, oh man, it's going to be great. It's going to be in the 50s. It's still in February. I'm excited. And you go outside and it's snowing again. And you're like, what was the weatherman thinking? It is snowy. It is cold. Instead of the bright sunshine you were expecting now, it's a gloomy, ah. <sighs> And it can affect our feelings. The thing is, our feelings can be affected by just about anything. They're fickle and they can change. And so that is a terrible thing for us, especially as Christians, to base our attitude off of. We shouldn't base it off of our feelings. We read in the definition, um, attitude influences an individual's choice of action and responses do challenges, incentives, and rewards, or stimuli. That's something else that shouldn't be able to dictate or control our attitude. Outside forces, things that we have no control of. You get called in by, you get called in by uh, uh, your boss. Hey, so-and-so um, didn't make it in, and we've got to get this product out. We've got to get this taken care of. So I need you to come in. I was going to the beach today. Well, I had plans with my family. Oh, it doesn't matter. If you don't come in, you're fired. Man, how do you think that starts your attitude off going into work? You know? And you have a terrible day. Outside stimuli can affect our attitude. I was going out sewing in with Jeff a few weeks ago. We're going to visit your friend, Rob, uh, David. And he gave us that business address over on Fallahy. There's no one there. So we went to the house next door. We walked through the grass, right? We knocked on the door, and we had a great conversation with a the guy there. You know, it was great. The guy listened. He, he got the plan of salvation. I was excited about it. We're wrapping up our night, and we're walking back through the grass in the dark. They've got a fence and dogs. And as I'm walking, just happy-go-lucky, that was a great, I stepped in a surprise. And my happy-go-lucky, man, this was a great, um, outside stimuli changed my attitude like that. It was affected. And I was, oh, it was a good visit, but man, my shoes, I got to go wash them now. We've got to be careful what affects our attitude. We've got to be so careful about it. Uh, someone calls in to work and you have to stay late. You know, our parents, uh, uh, something goes wrong and we don't have a babysitter. Our parents can't watch our kids or something happens and now our plans change. And things affect our attitude. But we can't let our feelings, we can't let outside stimuli affect our attitude. It says here in this verse, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Here's the thing. We have to control our attitudes, not feelings, not outside stimuli, other things happening, circumstances. You and I are responsible for our own attitudes. And it says, if we can't control that, our life is like a city that is broken down and without walls. We talked about walls. Walls are there to defend. They're there to protect. Israel has a wall around it to defend. To protect it. You have the Great Wall of China, which was built hundreds of years ago. Why? To defend the country against the Mongols. Walls are meant to, to, to defend. Whether, uh, let's see, you look at prisons, and they're there, they're, it's a little bit different situation, but they're still there to defend and protect the innocent, the common public, right? Even whether you agree, and I'm not getting into politics, politics, whether you agree with him or not, Donald Trump, he wants to build a wall, and he wants to because he wants, he wants to protect the country. That's why he wants to build it. When we lived in Uganda, 
we lived in a compound. And this compound had walls nine, ten feet high. And on top, it had, you know, those old Coke bottles. Well, that's what they use over there. They don't have cans. They broke so many of them, a bunch of them, and they are cemented on top of the compound wall, the, the property that we lived at. And to get in, there was a, a metal gate, and the gate had spikes on top of it. And the whole time we were there, there were people that were after my dad. There was people that tried to kill my dad. They waylaid him. They ambushed him out in the bush. Um, there was dangers that happened on a daily basis, but that wall was never breached. No one ever conquered it. It was there to defend our family. We had a neighbor. She was a witch doctor. She lived right outside the wall on, on the one side, right? And one night, pastor heard things going on. He heard loud voices, loud talking. He heard women screaming. Things were going on. They were getting robbed. And the lady that owned the house, she was out of town, but her daughters were there. And my dad goes outside. He's got a flashlight, and he pretended to be a security guard, and he chased them away. We were safe because we had the wall. But they did not have the wall. They were not safe. They were being robbed and perhaps even worse because they didn't have that defense there. And here the Bible is saying, if we can't control our own spirit, whether it be attitude, emotions, and feelings, if we can't control that, then we're just a city that is broken down and without walls. Anyone can come in and rob and pilfer, steal, do whatever they want. The thing is, we can't afford that as Christians. The Bible says in 1 Peter uh, 5.8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Satan's out there gunning for you and for me, anyone who's a city without walls. He's looking to destroy us. He wants to devour us. He can't take our salvation away, but he can make us ineffective if he can just get a foothold in our life, he wants to destroy us. So we cannot afford to not have a wall. We cannot afford to not have control. Not have control. We're talking about attitude today. Attitude today. So how do we, how do we defend ourselves? Well, there's some things we need to realize. First of all, your attitude should not be controlled by circumstances. It should not be controlled by circumstances. Let me ask. Um... Maria, does Tom make you happy? Huh. Don, does Jenny make you happy? Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. Miss Janet, does Doyle make you happy? Right there. Right there. See, it's not my wife's job to make sure I'm happy. You know, she can try. She ought to be a good wife and, and try and love on me and try and make me happy. But it's not her responsibility for me to be happy. Miss Janet hit the nail on the head. That is my responsibility. I'm the one to make sure that I'm happy. Why? I'm the one in control of my attitude. I shouldn't let it uh, uh, be influenced by outside stimuluses or circumstances. I am to control my attitude. I've been asked so many times, I'll tell people, yeah, I moved up here from Florida. Man, you moved to Michigan from Florida? Why in the world would you do that? You know, <laughs> amen. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. During this winter, yeah. Um, but, you know, they ask, well, let me ask, which one do you like better? I'll think in Florida, the beach, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the wildlife there, the no snow there, I mean, the tropical atmosphere, everything about, it's Florida. And in Michigan, we have snow, and we have snow, and we have snow, and some snow, I mean, and they ask, which do you like better? And they, they expect to hear Florida, right? Here's the thing. I choose to be happy, the happiest wherever I am, or wherever I'm at. Oh, so Michigan? No, wherever I'm at. Because here's the thing, I'm not going to let something like my location affect 
my attitude. We've got to be so careful uh, about protecting our attitude. Acts 16, turn there with me. Acts chapter 16. I think this story is amazing. Acts chapter 16. And we're going to start in verse 22. <clears throat> Acts 16, 22. It says, And the multitude rose up together against them. This is Paul and Silas. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Here, Paul and Silas, the only thing they're guilty of is preaching God's word. Preaching. And they are falsely accused. They are taken, and they are beaten. Man, they're, they're sore, they're hurting, they're bloody, they're beaten. They're not just thrown in prison, they're thrown into the inner prison. No one's escaping from there. And they're not just thrown into the inner prison. Their feet are put in the stocks. It's these wood beams with, with uh, uh, holes cut out for uh, uh, ankles, right? Ankles or wrists. So their feet are put in these, these large beams and they're locked down in there so that they can't get out. They've been beaten. They are sore in pain, bloody. They're sitting there uncomfortably. The, the, the wood's chafing their ankles and they can't get comfortable because of the way everything's situated. They're sitting there in this prison and we find them praying and singing praises to God. If that were to happen to the average Christian today, I guarantee you they would not be praying and singing. Average Christian. Oh, God! Why would you allow me to go through this? I was doing your will. God, why is this happening to me? Complaining. Whining about it. Questioning God. Doubting God. Why, God? Well, Paul and Silas aren't doing that. To God be the glory. Great things. He, I mean, they're singing praises to God. Why? Because they didn't let the circumstances no matter how bad they were, worse than probably any of us have ever faced, not letting the circumstances affect their attitude. They could sit there and sing praises to God. And then you read the rest of the story. They didn't know God was coming to break them out. I mean, they're there. Hey, maybe we get put to death. I don't know what's going to happen, but they're singing praises to God. And God comes through, and he opens up those chains and those stocks, and he sets them free. Man, their attitude was powerful. Their attitude. They understood verses like 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you. They were, even, they were able to be thankful in a time when they're miserable and uncomfortable and hurting and sore an average Christian at that point why God why they could sing their attitude is powerful uh, see our attitude is a choice it is something that we choose our attitude we can choose to let it be controlled by feelings and stimuli but here's the thing that's easy that's what most people do Allowing other things to dictate and control their attitude. But the thing is, we have to realize it's a choice. Something we choose. Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl, he was a psychologist during World War II. He and his wife, and shortly later his 65-year-old mother, were transported to the extin extinction camp Auschwitz. His mother is immediately murdered in the gas chamber, and his wife is moved to another camp where she is to die at the age of 24. He suffers for another year through typhoid fever, intense labor, cruel guards, and when he's rescued in 1945, he finds out that his brother has also been murdered in a concentration camp. And yet he said this. He said, Everything can be taken away from a man but one thing. The last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. 
He recognized attitude is a choice. It's a choice. And as Christians, it's very important that we realize our attitude is a choice. Something we choose, we can't let it be dictated by something else. Not only is our attitude a choice, but our attitude will affect the outcome. It'll affect the outcome. We've all heard the mot motivational stories, you know. Well, this guy, he was diagnosed. He was given just a couple months to live. But this guy, he said, I'm going to enjoy the last couple months of my life. And so what does he do? He's just happy all the time. And you know why? He's healed and he's cured. And did that happen? Maybe. Hopefully. I don't know. I preached a couple weeks ago on don't quit. And I, we read a, a, through a list of these men who had failed so many times about Benjamin Franklin, Abraham Lincoln, Michael Jordan. And they failed and they failed and they failed. And then finally they succeeded. They did something amazing. And that's got to be attributed to their attitude, their perseverance. To do amazing things like that, attitude is so important. Okay, so we have those things, but let's look at a biblical example. Biblical example. Turn over with me to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. Your attitude will affect the outcome. Here's how Jonah could have gone. Here's how it could have gone. God comes to Jonah and says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, that wicked city. Their wickedness has come up before me. I want you to preach to them. Jonah, he says, okay, God. I may not like it, but I'm going to choose to have a good attitude about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Jonah goes to Nineveh. He gets there to Nineveh. He's not swallowed by a whale. The acid doesn't eat up his flesh. He doesn't have a perpetual stink about him. Jonah, he goes into Nineveh. He starts preaching, God's judgment is coming. Repent. God's judgment is coming. People hear him. They hear the word of God. And they fear, they get on their knees, like the Bible talks about. They, 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 they rent their clothes, they cover themselves in sackcloth and ashes. They heard the gospel message. Instead of destroying the city, they repent and God spares it. And Jonah has a great part in a revival in the Bible. An enemy of Israel, this heathen nation, has come to know God. Why? Because Jonah did what he was told. And he had a good attitude about it. But that's not how it went, is it? God tells Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Nineveh, they're our enemy. <coughs> Nineveh, you, you don't know what they've done to our countrymen. Nineveh, I can't go there. And he runs in the opposite direction. So God allows a, a whale to come. And uh, Jonah, he's thrown over the board. And you think about it, Jonah's sin didn't just cost him. It cost those sailors, it cost the merchants they were carrying cargo to. But Jonah, he's thrown to the whale. That whale spits him up on land. God tells him again, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah, he finally, okay, God, I'll go to Nineveh. And he is bitter as can be. God's judgment is coming. Repent. God's judgment is coming. Now I've given him my message and I'm going to go sit and watch your city be destroyed. And what a terrible attitude. What a terrible attitude. Look at verse uh, chapter 3, verse 10 with me. It says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. We're in chapter 4 now. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life. What? My, uh, take, therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Really? You see... God do an amazing work and an enemy of Israel. They are coming to Christ. Hundreds, if not thousands of people are getting saved. It's a big city. And the Bible says it's three days journey. God is doing an awesome work there. People are getting saved. Oh, just kill me now, God. Unreal. 
Unreal. What a terrible attitude. And instead, now the outcome, the outcome is if Jonah had gone and obeyed and God spared the city, or Jonah disobeyed and God still spared the city, that outcome was the same, but the outcome for Jonah now is totally different. He's already been swallowed by a whale. Now, instead of reaping the blessings of God because of obedience, seeing something amazing, now because of his bad attitude, God's now blessing him. God's having to chastise him and deal with him because of his rotten attitude. His attitude affected his outcome. You know, God can still use someone with a bad attitude, but they are missing out on the blessings of God. You know, when I was in VBS, uh, when I was in Florida, our first vacation Bible school, I was so excited about it. We were doing Indiana Jones. That was the first one, right? Indiana Jones. I was so excited because I thought I was going to be the one running everything. I was so excited. I was super pumped about it. And we were having Madison come in, our home church in Alabama. They were going to come help us run it their way, the way they've done it before. They were going to help teach us, but I was going to be in charge. And I was, man, I was so excited. I'm, I think, 19, 20 years old. This is going to be fantastic. I'm in charge, and that's all I saw. And then I got word from Mom, from Brother Wally. Oh, we're going to have this other guy run it. He actually has experience running it. And you know what happened? My attitude. What? I thought I was going to... I was... And I was so mad and so miserable, I was now demoted to a lowly team leader. Man, and I had the absolute worst attitude. And my mom saw I had this attitude. My dad, I don't think he saw it because, you know, he didn't address it. But I had the worst attitude. And you know what? God still used me to help see people saved. But I missed out on the blessings. It wasn't until about halfway through the week I realized, you know what? I'm wrong. I don't want to be a hindrance here. And I changed my attitude and I started to reap the blessings of being part of it. But we all have bad attitudes at times, and we have to be so careful. God can still use us during this time with a bad attitude, but we're not going to get the blessings of it, and we might even get spanked from them. We might even be chastised from them, and it's just not worth it. He's going to use us either way. Might as well have a good attitude about it. You look at Joseph, everything Joseph went through. And I know I've preached about him recently, but I just absolutely love Joseph. His brothers sold him into slavery. You know, they absolutely hated him. He's falsely accused. He's thrown into prison. And at the end of his life, his father died and his brothers come before him. They are afraid that Joseph is now going to kill him. And Joseph says uh, in Genesis 50, 20, but as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. Joseph could have done whatever he wanted to do his brothers. You know what? Sell them into slavery. He had multiple opportunities before his dad was even there. But he had an attitude, God is in control. I'm trusting him. I'm relying on him. What they did was absolutely terrible. But I'm going to honor God. And his attitude affected the out outcome. God used him to do great and mighty things because God could trust him. How about these guys? How many of you know the name Shemua? How about this name? Shaphat. No? Igal. I might not be saying I'm right, but I think I am. Igal. Uh, Palti. No? Gadiel. Still nothing. Um, Gaddy? Amiel? Uh, a few more. Sether? Nabi or Nabi? N A H B I? No one? All right, one more. How about uh, Jewel? Jewel? Something like that. G E U E L. You heard those guys before? You have, actually. How about the guy? Named Joshua or Caleb. 
You see, all 12 of these guys were sent out to spy out the land of Canaan. They were sent to spy out the land of Canaan and bring back a report to the children of Israel. And they go in, and they see the lands flowing with milk and honey. They see, they see the blessings of God, what God, God has promised to them, and they are going to inherit. They see everything God has for them, and everything exciting about it. But ten of them also saw the giants, saw the issues and problems. And we sing it in children's church. Twelve men went to spy on Canaan. Ten were bad, but two were good. Ten came back. The ten names you didn't recognize, they came back and they gave a bad report. There's giants in the land. You brought us out of Egypt to die? How are we going to take this land? It's too much for us. We can't do that. But two guys had a good report. Joshua and Caleb, man, the blessings of God are so good there. God has so much for us. Yes, there's giants, but our God is bigger. We can conquer it. He's already promised it to us. We can do it. The children of Israel, they listened to the ten bad uh, spies. It says in Numbers 14, 22 through 23, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness. And we, sometimes we forget about that. We forget about everything God had just taken them through in Egypt. The plagues and how God spared the Israelites. They've just seen this. They've seen, they've seen, uh, uh, what is it? The Red Sea open up before them. And uh, I mentioned this, I think is on Thanksgiving. We think of the Red Sea, oh, from this side to, of the auditorium to that side. No, it's like nine miles and the sea opened up and they're going through. They can't even see the other side. They saw God's power. And now they're afraid of a few giants. And they gave a bad report. They have seen uh, my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any, man, any of them that provoked it see me. Their attitude towards what they saw in the promised land affected the outcome. Their attitude caused the Israelites to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Their attitude towards what they saw prevented anyone above the age of 20 from going into the promised land. Their attitude and what they saw got the 10 of them killed. But Joshua and Caleb, who came back with a good report, they had the good attitude. All of their peers are dying away. But even though they're older than 20, they get to go into the promised land. They get to see it. Why? Attitude. Their attitude determined the outcome. One last thing about our attitude. Our attitude is in need of regular maintenance. Attitude is like this. Attitude is like the rudder of a ship. You know, you take a ship or a boat out, you know, on a large body of water. And you get waves that are coming and, and they're, they're pushing the boat to and fro. And what does the boat start to do? You know, it can't stay on the same heading. It starts to turn and drift a little bit. And so what do you have to do? You have to take and, you know, maybe it's a steering wheel or an outboard motor or something, but the, 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 it's the same thing. The rudder, it's steering the ship. You have to constantly be adjusting the rudder and adjusting it. Every turmoil of your turbulence starting to turn the, rudder, the boat around, and you have to turn and correct it constantly. And our attitude is the same thing. Trials and tribulations and things happen in our life. It does affect our attitude. We are human, but we have to constantly be adjusting it and correcting it. Why? Because God's got something great for us if we maintain our attitude. If we don't control our attitude, Satan's out there waiting and watching, wanting to attack us. Wanting to attack us. We've got to constantly be maintaining our attitude. Hebrews 12, 15 says this, looking diligently lest any man fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Springing up. If anyone in here is, we're all humans. We've probably all been bitter at one point. What happens with bitterness? You know, it's an attitude. Bitterness. 
you get better at something, but then you get right with God. God, I know I'm not treating that person right. No, I know I don't have the right attitude towards them. Please forgive me. And you make it right. You make it right with that person. But what happens later is, you know, something happens. That person rubs you the wrong way. And automatically, oh yeah, I remember the one time you, and that root of bitterness springing up again. We've got to constantly be dealing with it. It's like our backyard. We can't just let our backyard, you know, grow without being maintained. We have to constantly pull out the weed eater, pull out the mower, maintain it regularly so the weeds don't get out of control. Same thing with our attitude. Constant maintenance. Constant maintenance. Paul understood this. He says in 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Attitude. It's so important for us as Christians to maintain our attitude, to watch our attitude. Remember that first verse. He that hath no control over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Satan's looking for people that are cities without walls. He's looking for a chance to attack. If we can't control our own spirit, it is a choice. We can't let outside stimulus or our feelings or something control it. We have to choose to control it. We have to maintain it regularly. And uh, it does determine the outcome. We've got to maintain our attitude. We're not going to have an invitation tonight, but I want to challenge you this. Go home and uh, take a look at your attitude. You know? And this may be, you know, you might have a fantastic attitude right now, but something may happen in the next couple of weeks. Keep this in your mind. Our attitude has to constantly be maintained. We need to be evaluating it. Use church to evaluate it. When pastor's up here preaching, and he's preaching on something, we need to be evaluating our attitude then. Oh, does he really mean that? Oh, does, uh, that's great for this person over here. Oh, that doesn't really bother me. Constantly checking our attitude. Don't worry about them. Don't worry about this. Focusing on our attitude and maintaining it. That's my challenge to you tonight.